Good day, brothers and sisters. It's really a privilege to be able to share with you again today. I want to return to the subject of the Trinity again. And this is not because I, I am fond of belaboring the same point. But there are so many different avenues to this subject and it seems like every day you hear of some new objection, some new angle that somebody wants to bring in. And there is the need of dealing with these issues and making them clear. In fact, today I want to talk about the, the roots or the origin of the Trinity. And I think this is really necessary because there are... I, I've read a number of articles in which the writers have been claiming that the doctrine of the Trinity really originated with the Old Testament writers. And I want us to examine that today, to look at it closely and see whether or not this, this idea really stands up to close examination. Now, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit constricted standing behind this pulpit. But, for the sake of the video, I'm going to do my best to not move about too much. So, I hope that this will be, this will come across the way I would like it to come across. Now, I'd like to begin by reading from a letter that was written by an Anglican clergyman. Now, this letter actually appeared in the Jamaican newspaper, The Observer. And it was written by this Anglican clergyman, Ernley Gordon, in response to some letter that an Adventist had written. Apparently, he had written a letter accusing the Adventists of being a cult or something of that nature. He had written some letter that had upset this Adventist gentleman. And so he responded with another letter. And then now, this man, Ernley Gordon, wrote this letter, which I will quote from. He said, My Adventist friends have misunderstood the article which appeared in the Observer of August 15 concerning cults. I quoted from a particular source because in the 1970s, certain editors deliberately removed portions of sentences giving the wrong interpretation. At no time did I say that the Adventist church in Jamaica is a cult. I stated, one, that the Adventists in Jamaica behave like a church and there are reasons for this. They are deemed a cult in many Latin American countries because of their anti-Roman Catholic stance. And number three, the Davidic suicide cult came out of the Adventist church in the USA. As long as the Adventists believe in the Trinity, the doctrine of the resurrection, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the primacy of the apostolic faith, slash the Bible, and accept the doctrines clarified by the historic ecumenical councils, they cannot be described as a cult. Now this letter, I found it to be very interesting. And if you, if you look closely at, at what it is saying, you will understand why. Because this man says that there are certain qualifications that Adventists have which disqualify them from being a cult. And one of them is that they believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. And they believe in the doctrines that were clarified by the historic ecumenical councils. We'll discuss that a little, a little further on. And because they believe in the primacy of the apostolic faith slash the Bible. Anybody who is in the Protestant tradition of Christianity will become suspicious at that term. The apost apostolic faith slash the Bible. What does that mean? Protestants believe that the Bible and the Bible alone is a sufficient guide, sufficient rule of faith. But here this gentleman is bringing in something else. The primacy of what he calls the apostolic faith. And the doctrines clarified by the historic ecumenical councils. If you are a Roman Catholic, or I suppose an Anglican, this is perfectly natural for you to believe. Perfectly natural for you to stand upon this foundation. But not if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, or any other kind of Protestant. 
And I think right here at the, at the very beginning we can see that there is something very suspicious about the origins and the roots of the Trinitarian doctrine. I'd like to read for you what the Encarta Encyclopedia says, or how the Encarta Encyclopedia defines the Trinity. It says, in Christian theology, it is the doctrine that God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are united in one substance or being. The doctrine is not taught explicitly in the New Testament, where the word God almost invariably refers to the Father. Now I know we, 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 discuss, we discuss this definition a little further on some of the other tips, but I want you to just think about that carefully. This doctrine was not explicitly stated in the New Testament. There, the word God almost invariably refers to the Father. That's interesting. When then, if not in the New Testament, when did the word Trinity, or when did the word God come to mean more than one person? And the same article continues. The term Trinitas was first used in the second century by the Latin theologian Tertullian. But the concept was developed in the course of the debates on the nature of Christ. In the fourth century, the doctrine was finally formulated. That is something to make us think, brothers and sisters. A doctrine that was formulated 400 years after Christ. A doctrine that does not come from the New Testament because notice what it says clearly that in the New Testament the word God refers almost invariably to the Father. Then the doctrine of the Trinity could not have come to us from the New Testament. As this encyclopedia says, it developed gradually during those first four centuries after the time of Christ. And, and, and the Encyc Encyclopedia Britannica agrees with this. In the article on the Trinity it says, the doctrine developed gradually over many centuries and through many controversies. Gradually. It was not something that was taught specifically by God, by Jesus, or by any of the apostles. It was of gradual development long after the Bible was completed. And this is why the Roman Catholics have claimed in more than one place. In fact, in the Life magazine, they have stated, our opponents sometimes claim that no belief should be held dogmatically, which is not explicitly stated in Scripture. But the Protestant churches have themselves accepted such dogmas as the Trinity, for which there is no such precise authority in the Gospels. And this is taken from the Life magazine of October 30, 1950. So you see, the Catholic Church claims that there is no precise authority for, for the Trinity, for the, 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 the doctrine of the Trinity in the Scriptures, but it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church. The Catholics know where this doctrine came from. It is so unfortunate that many who claim to be Protestants are either, are, are either willfully or inadvertently ignorant. Let me read also from another article by a Catholic author. It's entitled, 21 Reasons to Reject Sola Scriptura, or to Reject Scripture Only. It's taken from chapter 9 of the book, and the book was written by Joel Peters. Now I just want you to think about that, that, that title, 21 Reasons to Reject the Bible Alone. Now clearly you can tell that this is a Catholic defending the Catholic position. Catholics believe that the Bible alone is not good enough. They believe the tradition of the church, the tradition of history, the, 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 the voice of the Pope 
the council of the Catholic hierarchy, all of these things are authoritative. The Protestant says, no, scripture alone. And here this Catholic author says, here are 21 reasons why you should re reject the concept of scripture alone. In fact, we are looking at one of those reasons. Let me quote. He says, if you look at the history of the early church, you will see that it continually struggled against heresies and those who promoted them. We also see the church responding to those threats again and again by convening councils and turning to Rome to settle disputes in matters of doctrine. For example, Pope Clement intervened in a controversy in the church at Corinth at the end of the first century and put an end to a schism there. In the second century, Pope Victor threatened to excommunicate a large portion of the church in the East because of a dispute about when Easter should be celebrated. In the earlier part of the third century, Pope Callistus pronounced the condemnation of the Sabellian heresy. In the case of these heresies and or conflicts in discipline that would arise, the people involved would defend their erroneous beliefs by their respective interpretations of scripture, apart from sacred tradition and the teaching magisterium of the church. A good illustration of this point is the case of Arius, the 4th century priest who declared that the Son of God was a creature and was not co-equal with the Father. Arius and those who followed him quoted verses from the Bible to prove their claims. The disputes and controversies which arose over his teachings became so great that the first ecumenical council was convened in Nicaea in 325 AD to settle them. The council under the authority of the Pope declared Arius's teachings to be heretical and made some decisive declarations about the person of Christ. And it did so based on what sacred tradition had to say regarding the scripture verses in question. Here we see the teaching authority of the church being used as the final say in an extremely important doctrinal matter. If there had been no teaching authority to appeal to, then Arius' error could have overtaken the church. As it is, a majority of the bishops at that time fell for the Arian heresy. Even though Arius had based his arguments on the Bible and probably compared scripture with scripture, the fact is that he arrived at an heretical conclusion. It was the teaching authority of the church, hierarchically constituted, which stepped in and declared he was wrong. The application is obvious. If you ask a protestant whether or not Arius was correct in his belief that the Son was created, he will of course respond in the negative. Emphasize then that even though Arius presumably compared scripture with scripture, he nonetheless arrived at an erroneous conclusion. If this were true for Arius, what guarantee does the Protestant have that it is not also true for his interpretation of a given Bible passage? The very fact that the Protestant knows Arius' interpretations were heretical implies that an objectively true or right interpretation exists for the biblical passages he used. The issue then becomes a question of how we can know what that true interpretation is. The only possible answer is that there must be out of necessity an infallible authority to tell us. That infallible authority, the Catholic Church, declared Arius heretical. Had the Catholic Church not been both infallible and authoritative in its declaration, then believers would have had no reason whatsoever to reject Arius' teachings. And the whole of Christianity today might have been comprised of modern-day Arians. It is evident then that using the Bible alone is not a guarantee of arriving at doctrinal truth. The above-described result is what happens 
when the erroneous doctrine of sola scriptura is used as a guiding principle and the history of the church and the numerous heresies it has had to address are undeniable testimony to this fact. Now this quotation, that is the end of the quote. This quotation hardly needs any comment, but I'll just briefly highlight one or two things. This man stands on the position that the Bible alone, that concept is foolishness. The Bible alone can never help us to completely arrive at truth. What we need, he says, is a teaching authority that is infallible. And he says, this authority is the church. And of course, he means the Catholic church. And he uses the case of the Arian controversy in 325 AD, which was the the, 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 the focal point for the development of the Trinitarian concept. And he says, this is what proves the church's teaching authority. He says, the, the Protestant knows that Arianism was wrong. How does the Protestant know? I suppose because it has come to us across the ages. People refer to it, theologians refer to it as the, 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 the eternal, uh, as one of the eternal verities. One of the things that you just don't argue with our question. But why don't people argue with our question, the doctrine of the Trinity? Because the council back in 325 AD pronounced upon the nature of Christ and upon the nature of God. And Christians today just don't argue with that. But this man is saying that the reason you don't argue with that is because you recognize that the Catholic Church had the authority to pronounce upon this thing. He says Arius studied his Bible. And Arius was using scripture, but the church was bigger than the scripture. Is that what you believe as a Protestant? And yet this is the foundation of this doctrine of the Trinity. Now before I proceed any further, I just want to define carefully what we mean when we talk about the Trinity. Because I think... It's possible there might be somebody who is watching this videotape who is not quite sure exactly what the Trinitarian teaching is. And, and I think this is important because I've met many people who believe that all the Trinity says is that there's a God and there's a Son and there's a Holy Spirit. And I don't think any Christian who reads the Bible can deny that there is a God the Father and there is the Son of God and that there is a Holy Spirit. And some people believe that that is all that the Trinity teaches. But I need to make it clear. Because the Trinity has a very specific definition. And even though there are several variations of this doctrine, all of them basically have one basic idea. And it's very important that we understand it. First of all, there is what I will call the orthodox concept. And why I, why I refer to this as, a, as an orthodox concept is because this is a concept that developed out of that meeting at this council back in Nicaea in AD 325. It grew out of that. This orthodox concept, this is what the Carter Encyclopedia referred to when it says that God is one being, one substance with three persons. Now this is a concept that we are told it exists nowhere in nature. It exists nowhere in human experience. God, we are told, is a mysterious entity outside of and beyond anything we have ever experienced. He is one substance, one being. But somehow within that being, there are three persons. Or to use the theological term, three hypostases. And the, and the word hypostases, we are told, means persons, but, but persons in a sense that we don't understand. It's persons not as we understand persons as individuals without connection to another person. But it's three persons becoming one being. That's the best I can say. And I don't think any theologian can give you a better definition because nobody understands this concept. And the inequalities of it and the mysteries of it are relegated to are, are covered by the word mystery. We are told that the Trinity is a mystery. And whether you understand or not, it is true. But it's a mystery. And that ought to cover all the questions. This is the orthodox concept of the Trinity. All three parts or persons make up one great being. This being has all power, all knowledge, and has existed forever 
with his three parts or persons. Then there is another concept of the Trinity, which some refer to as modalism. Theologically, I believe it is called Sabellianism. Because the man who first came up with this idea was named Sabellius. This concept, in this concept, God is only one person, but he reveals himself in different ways at different times. For example, in the Old Testament, he was the Father. Then he, the same person, took on the form of the Son when Christ came to earth. And afterwards he became the Holy Spirit. This belief is commonly referred to as the Jesus only doctrine. Then there is what I would call a tritheistic concept. And of course you know the word tri tritheist simply means one who believes in three gods. Tritheism is the belief in three gods. And I suppose even Trinitarians who believe in three, in three gods will deny that they believe in three gods. But when you look at the definition of the word, you will see that if there is any honesty and straightforwardness, what we are talking about is three gods, and there can be no logical denying of that fact. In this concept, there is the belief that there are three almighty beings or persons who have all exactly the same authority, the same power, and who have all lived together for all eternity. All three are said to be God, absolutely and fully divine in the fullest possible sense. But because they are in agreement in everything they do, they are said to be one God. You can tell right away that what we are doing here is redefining the word God. We are using the word God to speak about agreement between three gods. According to this, this belief, these three beings or gods decided long, long ago to act in three different roles. One decided to act as father, one to act as son, and one to work as the Holy Spirit. Now. The Trinity is regarded as being so sacred, so untouchable, that I think it's interesting when we look at how it began and where it came from. And so I'd like us to turn to the subject of the roots of the Trinity. Most people say, well I wouldn't say most people, most Christians say the Trinity began in the Bible. Historians tell us it began 300 years after the Bible was completed. But let us dig a little deeper and see where this doctrine of the Trinity really began. And I'm going to present some evidence here that I don't know how a Trinitarian can deal with it. But it needs to be examined. I'll begin by reading from the book The Two Babylons, written by Alexander Hislop. And most of us are familiar with this book, or I think many of us are familiar with this book. Alexander Hislop, Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, has been a source reference for many Protestants in researching on the development of the apostasy in ancient times. He says on page 17, and the quotation goes over to page 18, the papacy has in some of its churches, as for instance, in the monastery of the so-called Trinitarians of Madrid, an image of the triune God with three heads on one body. The Babylonians had something of the same. Mr. Layard, in his last work, has given a specimen of such a triune divinity worshipped in ancient Assyria. The accompanying cut of such another divinity worshipped among the pagans of Siberia is taken from a medal in the imperial cabinet of St. Petersburg and given in Parsons' Japhet. In India, the supreme divinity in like manner in one of the most ancient cave temples is represented with three heads on one body under the name of Eko Deva Trimurti, one god three forms. In Japan, the Buddhists worship their great divinity Buddha with three heads 
in the very same form under the name of San Pao Fu. All these have existed from ancient times. While overlaid with idolatry, the recognition of a trinity was universal in all the ancient nations of the world. Now I want you to think about that, brothers and sisters. Just think for a moment. This man says that, yes, the papacy had, had images representing the trinity in its churches. But he says, these images went back to Babylon. They went back to India. They went back to Japan. He, he names several countries where hundreds of years before there was a Christian church. People worshipped a God in a Trinitarian form. And yet many people are saying that the Trinity really originated in the Old Testament. And some have even suggested that these pagans, these heathen religions adopted this concept of the Trinity from the Jews. Now let us examine that for a moment. First of all, I want to read from two sources where people have made this suggestion. And I'm just reading from these two, not because they are the only two, but they are prominent writers, well recognized. I'm reading from the book Truth Triumphant, written by Benjamin Wilkinson. I'm reading from page 120. Here is what Benjamin Wilkinson says. He says, the revelations of the Old Testament had disclosed the Trinity. In a disfigured and uncouth semblance, Zoroaster proclaimed his pieces of a trinity. Let me pause here to just comment. Zoroaster is the person who founded the Persian religion called Mithraism. And he's saying here that Zoroaster modeled his version of the trinity upon something he gained from the Old Testament. He says the Old Testament had disclosed the, the Trinity. It's interesting that Benjamin Wilkinson does not tell us where the Old Testament discloses this Trinity. It would be very interesting to find where exactly in the Old Testament he finds this Trinity disclosed because the people who wrote the Old Testament, the Jews, are convicted today, have always been convicted from the very beginning of their existence as a nation, that there was only one God, one person, one being. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses never believed. There's not a hint that Moses believed in a God who was more than one person. Yet Wilkinson here says that the Zoroastrians, the Persians, developed their concept of the Trinity from the Old Testament. That is interesting. He says, he continues by saying, He, that is Zoroaster, placed at the head of his celestial hierarchy, Ormazd, otherwise called Ahura Mazda, the great wise spirit, and Ariman, the supreme evil spirit, who was the co-evil and rival god of darkness, dwelling in the bottomless pit of night. With them he associated in a marked way Mithra, the god of light, who was the sun and an embodiment of sun worship. As the sun was neither in the heavens nor on earth, but swung in an intermediate position between heaven and earth, so Mithra was the great mediator. When Mithraism had overspread the Roman Empire, Mithra was said to be the champion of sinners, the companion after death and the guide of the soul into the heaven of heavens. I want you to remember that definition that, uh, that Zoroaster came up with, that definition of God. In fact, we are going to talk about it again a little further down. But remember that definition, because Benjamin Wilkinson says he got it from the Old Testament. Alexander Hislop says the same thing in the two Babylons. On page 18 he says, while overlaid with idolatry, the recognition of a trinity was universal in all the ancient nations of the world, proving how deep-rooted in the human race was the primeval doctrine on this subject, which comes out so distinctly in Genesis. The triune emblem of the Assyrian divinity shows clearly 
what had been the original patriarchal faith. That is amazing. Alexander Hislop says that the, 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 the Assyrians maintained their concept of a Trinitarian, a triune God. And this shows that the, the early Hebrews had maintained this concept. But the strange thing, my brothers and sisters, is that while the Assyrians, the Zoroastrians, and all these people maintained a Trinitarian concept, the Jews never did. Did they lose it in the darkness of Egypt? Well, God brought them out of Egypt, gave them his laws, gave them a concept of himself far superior to anything they had ever seen, that was ever seen in paganism. And yet God never revealed that he was a trinity, that even today and in every age, the Jews have believed that God is a single individual, not a trinity. Something is very wrong. Commentators today... Many of them, Trinitarians, claim that the word Elohim, the Hebrew word Elohim, discloses the idea of a trinity. As we have seen, Alexander Hislop says that the, the Trinitarian concept of God comes out so clearly in Genesis. Again, like Benjamin Wilkinson, he offers no evidence to back up what he says. Because you may read Genesis through from the first word to the last word in the last chapter and you will not find a Trinitarian God. The word Elohim, it has been said that this Hebrew word signifies a plurality of persons within the Godhead. Since it is a plural form of the word El, which means God. But what is very significant is the fact that although this is a Hebrew word, the Hebrews themselves, who best understand their own language, have never and still do not believe in a plurality of gods. I mean, is it possible for somebody to study somebody's language and understand meanings in that language, meanings in the words that were formulated by the people themselves, that the people themselves never knew, never saw? There is so much that is illogical and unreasonable in this line of argument that it is a marvel that so many people have swallowed it, have accepted it, hook, line, and sinker. It's amazing. It just doesn't make sense when you examine it closely. The Shema, the primary tenet of Jewish faith is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. And this contains the very word Elohim. And yet it is the immovable basis upon which the Jews anchor their concept of a single God who is one great being. The word Elohim in fact, and I think we dealt with this in one of our other tapes, but I'm just going to briefly revise a little bit of it. The word Elohim really carries the meaning of the divine majesty. It is what is called the divine plural. To bring out the concept of the majesty and the greatness of God, instead of adding an adjective. What happens here in the Hebrew language is that the word Elohim is pluralized. And in this way, the concept of God as a, as a, as a, as a great being, as a divine being, as a majestic being, is brought out. And this is the, 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 the opinion of many Bible scholars. And when you look at the way the word is used, you have to conclude that it really seems to be the real meaning of this word Elohim in many cases, in many instances. The, the word is used to refer to Jehovah, the true God, many times. This we accept. But if Elohim really means gods, then what it means is that the Jews did not worship one God because Elohim means literally gods. And yet God said that there is only one God. He said there is only one Elohim. Is there only one God's? Does that make sense? In Exodus 7 and verse 1, we see the same usage of the word when God says to, to Moses, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. I have made thee a Elohim to Pharaoh. Clearly he did not mean he was making Moses into a trinity or into any kind of plurality of God's. In Judges 16 and verse 23, the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, their Elohim. Again, Dagon was an individual idol. Dagon was, was one of those 
those idols that the, the Philistines worshipped who had a, a fish's body. He was an individual, not a plurality of gods. But the word Elohim is used. For they said, Our God, our Elohim, hath delivered Samson into our hand. The same thing happens in Judges 16 and verse 24. When the people saw him, they praised their God, their Elohim. For they said, Our God, our Elohim, hath delivered into our hands our enemy. In 1 Kings 18 and verse 27, when Elijah encountered the Baal worshippers on Mount Carmel, it says in verse 27, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God, that is Elohim. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey or peradventure, he sleepeth and must be awake. These show clearly, brothers and sisters, that Elohim does not necessarily mean a plurality of gods. And in the case of the true God, it absolutely does not mean that. And as we have, as we have seen, as we have said, the primary belief of Judaism is that there is only one God. This is their foundational belief. The Hebrews, who had the most complete revelations from and the highest conceptions of God, had no concept of a Trinitarian God. But they insisted strongly upon the very opposite. And every one of us who is able to think must consider that these people whom God chose and to whom He revealed Himself most fully had no concept of a trinity, while the heathen all around them had this concept. Did these heathen have a better understanding of the nature of God than did the Jews? Now when we look at the trinitarian concepts of the, the heathen, something interesting comes out, something interesting and even frightening. And I'm going to ask you to just bear with me while I read some quotations from a few respectable sources. To bring out my point, let us look at the, the, the Trinitarian concept of the Trinity. The Trinitarian are one aspect of the, are one concept of the Egyptian Trinity. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, in the article entitled Horus, it says, Horus and the god Seth were perpetual antagonists who were reconciled in the harmony of Upper and Lower Egypt. In the myth of Osiris, Horus was the son of Osiris. He was also the opponent of Seth, who murdered Osiris and contested Horus' heritage, the royal throne of Egypt. So let me just repeat that. It says that Osiris was the father of Horus, but there was an enemy that they both have, they both had, and that this enemy was named Set. According to the, the Egyptian myths, this god Seth murdered Osiris and contested Horus, or contested Horus for, the her for, his, for his heritage, the royal throne of Egypt. In the same book, or in the same source, Encyclopedia Britannica, in the article on Seth, it says that Seth was represented as a composite figure with a canine body, with a dog's body, slanting eyes, square-tipped ears, forked tail, and a long, curved, pointed snout. That's interesting. He was a god worshipped by the Egyptians who had some very strange features. As you listen to the, to the description, something may come to your mind. I don't know. Something does come to my mind. It says, originally Seth was a sky god, Lord of the desert, master of storms, disorder and warfare. In general, he was a trickster. Seth embodied the necessary and creative element of violence and disorder within the ordered world. In the Persian version of the Trinity, again we go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and the article entitled, Ahura Mazda. It says, according to Zoroaster, Ahura Mazda created the universe and the cosmic order that he maintains. Three gods are combined and treated as a single being, addressed in the singular. In this way, the spiritual force of Egyptian religion shows a direct link with Christian theology.
That's amazing because that is exactly what the orthodox concept of the Trinity is. Three gods linked together as one and addressed as a single being. Because we are told that when we speak of God, you know, Christians refer to God as he and him. But they say we are really talking about three. This, we are told, is what was happening or what happened in Egyptian religion. The exact same thing as the Christian, quote-unquote, Christian trinity. The Encyclopedia Britannica, in an article entitled Arianism, gives us the background to how this doctrine came into the Christian church. It says that there was a, a controversy that arose over the teachings of a priest called Arius, and it continues, and here I quote, It affirmed that Christ is not truly divine, but a created being. Arius's basic premise was the uniqueness of God, who is alone, self-existent and immutable. The Son, who is not self-existent, cannot be God. Because the Godhead is unique, it cannot be shared or communicated, so the Son cannot be God. According to its opponents, especially the Bishop Athanasius, Arius' teaching reduced the Son to a demigod, reintroduced polytheism, since the worship of the Son was not abundant, and undermined the Christian concept of redemption, since only he who was truly God could be deemed to have reconciled man to the Godhead. The controversy seemed to have been brought to an end by the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, which condemned Arius and his teaching, and issued a creed to safeguard Orthodox Christian belief. This creed states that the Son is of one substance with the Father, thus declaring Him to be all that the Father is. He is completely divine. In fact, however, this was only the beginning of a long, protracted dispute. So, brothers and sisters, what we are being told here in the Encyclopedia Britannica is that Arius, this priest Arius, was concerned about the fact that the Bible teaches that God is only one. And he was so concerned about this, and he couldn't understand how if God is one, Jesus could also be God. And so he began to teach that Jesus was actually a created being. And this is what brought matters to a head at Nicaea in AD 325. The final creed that was formulated and accepted there was that Jesus is of one substance with the Father. And that is the important thing about the Trinitarian belief. That's the important idea. One substance. If you are a part of the same substance as another being, in actual fact, there's no difference between your identities. That is why... The term person in the Trinitarian concept of God is such an unusual term and such an undefinable term. How can one being, one substance be made up of two different persons? That is a part that is declared to be a mystery. And yet all of this had to be done because they were trying to reconcile the two ideas that Jesus is God and the Father is God. And they are two different persons and yet they are one substance, the same God. And so you see, two impossible ideas came together, and the solution that they came up with was an impossible solution that is only explained by the word mystery. But there were factors other than scripture at this Council of Nicaea. And this is clearly declared to be so, again, by independent secular commentators. In the New Universal Dictionary, which is really a, actually a French publication, I don't think I can pronounce the French name, but it's actually the New Universal Dictionary. It says that the Platonic Trinity itself, let me, let me reread that with a little more in emphasis. The Platonic Trinity itself, notice here that the word Plato is mentioned, and, you'll, and we will find that there are several other sources that speak about Plato and the influence that he had on the, the thinking of many Christians at that time. Plato, who was a pagan philosopher, and how his thinking and his idea of a trinity really influenced the way that these people thought when they came together at Nicaea, and actually affected the conclusion they came to. This dictionary says, 
the Platonic Trinity itself, merely a rearrangement of older trinities, dating back to earlier peoples, appears to be the rational philosophic trinity of attributes that gave birth to the three hypostases or divine persons taught by the Christian churches. This Greek philosopher's conception of the divine trinity can be found in all the ancient pagan religions. The New Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge says, the doctrines of the Logos and the Trinity received their shape from Greek fathers who were much influenced directly or indirectly by the Platonic philosophy. That errors and corruptions crept into the church from this source cannot be denied. And again we read in a publication entitled The Church of the First Three Centuries. The doctrine of the Trinity was of gradual and comparatively late formation. It had its origin in a source entirely foreign from that of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. It grew up and was engrafted on Christianity through the hands of the Platonizing fathers. And again we find here an independent witness who states exactly what I've been saying that it had a source entirely outside of the Hebrew and the Jewish scriptures. And there is no unbiased student who studies the scriptures who will find it difficult to agree with what this person has stated. The Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, Britannica as respectable a source as the Britannica states in the article on Christianity. The basic concern of Arius was and remained disputing the oneness of essence of the Son and the Holy Spirit with God the Father in order to preserve the oneness of God. The Son thus became a second God under God the Father. That is, he is God only in a figurative sense for he belongs on the side of the creatures even if at their highest summit here, Arius joined an older tradition of Christology which had already played a role in Rome in the early 2nd century, namely the so-called Angel Christology. The descent of the Son to Earth was understood as the descent to Earth of the highest prince of the angels who became man in Jesus Christ. He is to some extent identified with the angel prince Michael. In the old angel Christology, the concern is already expressed to preserve the oneness of God, the inviolable distinguishing mark of the Jewish and Christian faiths over against all paganism. The Son is not himself God, but as the highest of the created spiritual beings, he is moved as close as possible to God. Arius joined this tradition with the same aim, that is, defending the idea of the oneness of the Christian concept of God against all reproaches that Christianity introduces a new, more sublime form of polytheism. The main speaker for church orthodoxy was Athanasius of Alexandria, for whom the point of departure was not a philosophical speculative principle, but rather the reality of redemption, the certainty of salvation, the redemption of humanity from sin and death is only then guaranteed if Christ is total God and total human being. The final dogmatic formulation of the Trinitarian doctrine in the so-called Athanasian Creed, una substantia, tres personae, one substance, three persons, reached back to the formulation of Tertullian. In practical terms, it meant a compromise in that it held fast to both basic ideas of Christian revelation, the oneness of God, and divine self-revelation in the figures of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, without rationalizing the mystery itself. Well, this quotation from the Encyclopedia Britannica really gives us, in a nutshell, the main, the main concepts and difficulties that came together at Nicaea. 
Arius, on the one hand, wanted to preserve the idea that God was a single person. He could not see how God could be one, and at the same time there are two persons, or even three, within God. The Athanasians, on the other hand, were determined to reconcile both ideas. God is one, and yet God is, there are two persons, three persons who are God. And they brought these two ideas. The Britannica says in the end that they ended up with a compromise. And this compromise consisted of enunciating the idea without explaining it. One God, three persons. No explanation, but simply enunciating it. Why, you may ask, why did it have to become a question of was he creature or was he God? I mean, why wasn't the plain biblical middle ground taken? He was not a creature. The Bible never says Jesus is a creature. But neither does the Bible teach that Jesus is God himself. There is a middle ground. What the Bible teaches is that he was the divine son of God. Why did not both parties take the plain, simple, biblical middle ground? Again, we find an answer in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, From the outset, the controversy between both parties took place upon the common basis of the Neoplatonic concept of substance. Again, you find here, Plato comes into the picture. The concepts of Plato were so embedded into the minds of these men that they could not escape its influence in this council. The Britannica says that, the controversy took place upon the common basis of the Neoplatonic concept of substance which was foreign to the New Testament itself. It is no wonder that the continuation of the dispute on the basis of the metaphysics of substance likewise led to concepts that have no foundation in the New Testament, such as the question of the sameness of essence, homoousia, or similarity of essence, homoousia, of the divine persons. And if you're not familiar with the whole debate, you know, one group of people said that he was of the same substance. The, the Aryans said he is of similar substance, but not the same substance. But the Trinitarians said he's the same substance. And it, 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 the, 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 the debate took place around one single little word, two little words, homoousia or homoousia, with a, with a single I in the middle of one word being the basic difference between whether it meant the same substance or similar substance. I read some place that it was from this controversy that the term developed. It does not matter one iota because you know that little iota in the middle of the word was what they were arguing about. But of course it wasn't just an iota, it was an important important issue. Is Jesus God himself or is he a different being from God? The argument was based on philosophical concepts, the, Britannica, the, the Britannica says, which were not in the word of God. Please note that even though this council form, formally declared that Jesus was begotten and not made, if you will read what is called the Apostolic Creed, you will see that it, it says that he was begotten and not made. But the statement that he is of the same being as the Father, the same substance, makes a mockery of the term begotten. Since he is of the same substance, the same being, then he cannot have been the Son of God in any understandable sense. In truth, I think Arius was closer in saying that the Father and the Son were of similar, but not the same substance. A father and son always are of the same kind of substance. My son is of, is of flesh, human flesh. He carries my, my, my blood type. My genes are identical to his. Or he carries elements of my genes in his body. Because he is my son. But he cannot be of the same substance or else he would be me. This then is the root of the Trinitarian belief. This history that we have traced through the Old Testament and now in the post-New Testament times, this is the root of the Trinitarian belief. This is how it made its way into the teachings of Christianity. From this beginning, 
the doctrine of the Trinity has steadily and relentlessly insinuated itself into the beliefs of nearly all of Christendom so that today there is scarcely a Christian group which is not infected with its insidious poison in one way or another. Learned theologians refer to it as one of the eternal verities of the Christian faith. This is one of the favorite terms of Leroy Froome in the book Movement of Destiny. He uses the word over and over and especially on pages 35 and 36 he defines these eternal verities and says and, and says that it, it really means, it, it, it's really talking about the Trinity and affiliated doctrines. So powerfully has this doctrine permeated the thinking of men that a failure to accept it will result in a group being instantly labeled as a cult. When you examine this history of the Trinity and look at its place today in Christian thinking, You think it's easy to believe, it's easy to believe that the biblical teaching has been fulfilled when it says that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. When the Bible testifies that a time would come when darkness would cover the earth and gross darkness the people. It's not difficult to understand that this time has arrived when you, when you see that this basic teaching of Christian faith, the teaching concerning God, has been so perverted and corrupted, and yet the perversion is accepted and held up as the great standard without which you cannot be accepted as a Christian. Things have truly been turned upside down in the kingdom of God. But you know, that is the dark side of it. The brighter side, brothers and sisters, is that God will never bring His work to a close until things are made right. The message that, he, that John the Baptist brought, the message that was prophesied in Isaiah was that John the Baptist said to the people, Behold your God. Revelation 14 shows us a people who go out and they proclaim. Under the symbolism of an angel, we see people who go out and proclaim, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment is come. As we saw in another message, in Revelation chapter 7, the people who are finally redeemed are in no question or controversy or doubt about who God is. They know who God is. And so I want to say to you today, you know, every time we try to present a message, there are always mistakes. There is nobody, I think, who can... We can give a Bible study, preach a sermon without making many mistakes. We are human beings. I'm sure if somebody were to take this message and to try to dissect it and to pick it to pieces, you will find that the sentences are, are not well rounded up. You'll find that there are, there are mistakes, perhaps even tiny bits of misquotation. Or perhaps, I hope not. But it is possible. I'm saying this because, you know, I have a friend who likes to take my articles, my sermons, and find faults. But you know what he does? When he finds these faults, he does not suggest alternatives. It's easy to pick anything to pieces because nobody is perfect. But I'm going to ask you to be honest. Look at the basic teachings of this message. Look at the evidence presented and ask yourself the question, does it make sense? Did the Trinity really come to us from the Hebrews? Did it come to us in the New Testament? Did it come to us from a legitimate source in the 4th century AD? Where did it really come from? And I believe that the evidence presented here is clear enough. And if we are truly desirous of serving God and Him alone, and of listening to God and Him alone, and not following men and their traditions and their systems, then the time is here for us to do something. If we have, if we have embraced this false concept of the Trinity. God bless you brothers and sisters, I appreciate the time you have taken to watch this tape and it is my hope that you have learned something that will help you to serve God more faithfully. It is my prayer that His Holy Spirit will continue to guide and direct you in the search for truth. God bless you.